Amid the 15th and 16th centuries, rumors began running rampant about a lost city of gold. These rumors continued to develop into stories of statues and lakes made of gold and inspired expeditions set out to find these supposed riches. Today, we explore the fact and fiction behind the story of El Dorado. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to Red Web, the show all about the unsolved. We got some true crime, we got some mysteries, we got some cryptids, aliens, and today we're exploring another lost city. We talked about Atlantis before, but now we're going to the to the turf side, deep into the Amazon, the potential lost city of gold. I'm your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, joining me, reacting to this mystery for the very first time. Alfredo Diaz. Good old El Dorado. El Dorado. So many thoughts circling in my head right now. Immediately the Disney movie. Uh, yes. 100%. I can't not see that in my head anymore. I haven't seen it in a million years, mm -hmm. but that's what came to mind. Mm -hmm. um, follow up to that. I think some of my, I think like two or three out of my top favorite missions that we've ever covered are like treasure hunts. Yeah. Maybe that's why I like National Treasure so much. You know what? <laughs> you know what I mean? like, Fantastic movie. <laughs> Can't speak for the longer run franchise, but right? In the, the, the TV show mm -hmm. that I, I just dodged that one. I'm a sucker for some uh, historic treasures right. and a bit of Nick Cage. Yeah, you, you try hunting treasure. You got mummy, all those kind of like you know good adventures. Indiana Jones. Dang, um, the mummy, you're right. Yeah, I mean it's good stuff. I think that you're right. There's because something there, to there was, treasure hunting. Go for it. There was the novel. Mm -hmm. In which you you know the about the fairies and the the lands, all that kind of stuff, and you're able yeah. to go out and hunt it down. The 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 secret the secret is yeah. that what you're talking about oh, yeah, yeah it was a secret and then we've also talked we've talked about a we few. talked about the 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 like island that just lost people money like the money pit the money pit yeah, yeah. absolutely I mean so it's like those are up there for me yeah um so I'm very excited for El Dorado same all I know is well I forgot everything in the Disney movie <laughs> but what I do know is the fact that just like it's a lost city of gold yep it's an Amazon mm -hmm. Amazon all on its own terrifying. Terrifying and definitely unexplored. Yeah. Dense jungle, rivers everywhere, constantly changing uh, in I that mean, sense. Every, a million things there that can kill you. Mm -hmm. They're discovering all kinds of creatures, uh, bugs, all that kind of stuff uh, every year. Yes. And it's just dense and, and I don't know, you just get, it's dense and humid. I just hate creepy crawlies and that's enough to keep me out of any body of uh, forest. Oh, you know what it reminds me of? If I just ended up in the Amazon though, I'd be, I'd be, Terrified. It's huge. It's I mean, huge. You'd be lost. You'd be lost. And there's again, like you said, there's so many undiscovered creatures that are poisonous, fighting for their own lives. Mm -hmm. But there's so many things yet to be discovered in the dense forest that yeah, it'd be there, it'd be freaky. There was a show. Sorry, I know we'll get right get into, into it. it. But there was a show, uh, it had like a season or two, but it was like people that traveled along the Amazon. Uh, I think it was a family looking for like a dad or something like that. But like Swiss every, Family Robinsons. Yes. That was it. Are you what? No, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good yes, and I, you confused me. He played tennis and so you sent it right back. All right. Um, but every episode, they would experience a new thing oh. in the Amazon. One episode would be a cryptid, one episode would be like a ghost or the paranormal, etc. Yeah. Um, so it was it was a pretty fun show to watch for cool. I think a season or two. Um, and then it was canceled. But uh that was it just they reminded me of this stuff. right now. Oh, they figured yeah, it all out. Yeah, the story kind of progressed and then they left it on a cliffhanger and then oh, okay. just they kind of like petered off. Yeah. Um, so like that's what this kind of reminds me of. Also, the spiders in the Amazon also reminds me of arachnophobia. That movie was terrifying. Oh, the, the scene I mostly remember from that is... The, uh, the spider came back from the Amazon, there was did a it not? Well, yeah, I think something like that. But then there was a beautiful woman taking a shower. Oh, spider, the spider came down like and then rinsed off and went down between yes! the, the, uh, the bosom. If I, remember I just the, remember that yep. scene. Yeah, no, there was that scene. I forgot about that scene. I was scene. a young I man. <laughs> but the, the spider, I think there was explorers in the yes. Amazon. And then a big old spider. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about a big, big boy. Um, got into one of their bags or yeah. the crates. And then um, was just like, made its way onto like a farm. And then hatched a ton of yep. eggs. And there's a ton of listeners right now freaking out because of the creepy crawlies. And then there was just it's possible, so man. many little spiders you ever see those uh those bushels of bananas that have made it from across seas or from you know the latin americas uh that have spiders in them oh depending geez. on i mean it depends on where they come from but yeah there's banana spiders oh come on man banana that's, that's totally real i don't know what kind of species they are but they're huge all right it's amazon terrifying el dorado here we come we're coming for it so i just want to give a shout out to uh 
Task Force member JT Grant mm. for uh, sharing their love of treasure hunts and suggesting that we do this one. So we are, in fact, I want to start giving more credit to the to the Task Force members that shout out yeah. their favorite topics guys, for us to cover. A lot of topics. Yeah. So, all right. With that said, let's talk about the history behind what has become known as El Dorado. Starting in the 15th century, European explorers started exploring South America. They soon discovered gold with which to grow their wealth. In their search for gold, conquistadors from Europe heard rumors from the indigenous peoples of a fabled location called El Dorado. It was sometimes also called the lost city of gold. They kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Now it is believed to be a city made entirely out of gold somewhere in South America. And we all know South America is quite big and I wanted to look this up to figure out just how big it is. Surprisingly, and remember, a lot of it's forest, a lot of it's mountainous, right. a lot of it's impassable. 6.9 million square miles, or if you prefer, 17.84 million square kilometers. Jeez. It's a big boy. Gee. Uh, yeah. I have a question. I have a potential answer, Is in there, theory, it, or the chair's right over there. Oh, that's true. It was very busy. They couldn't hear your eyebrow. So it's but just, they, but be, <laughs> is it supposed to be just like this treasure trove of gold, this big giant temple of, made out of gold? That's the thing. Okay, so I have, I've written in the notes somewhere mm -hmm. later on. I know it's coming. Oh yeah, here, I'll just read it right now because it's literally a few lines away. Your gut instincts okay. can predict the future. Now, gold was seemingly so abundant in this new world that uh, a lot of the people coming through the conquistadors hearing these stories mm -hmm. might have thought it's entirely possible that this new world was able to make full cities out of gold because this, these are new lands as far as the europeans are concerned right so that's my kind of opinion on the matter mm -hmm. but i do think that that is part of what elevated the story to to explode into such a big there's a full lake of it or there's buildings made out of gold or people made out right. of gold because it's just i mean look i don't know anything about anything yeah. like i always say but like a whole city made out of gold we know better now that that's true yeah back then it's like oh who knows maybe yeah. there's just like a mountain full of it right um so that's what makes el dorado hard for me to believe or it's just the route of it being completely exaggerated you right. know, behold, El Dorado and it's two chairs and a table made out of Could you gold. you imagine just I a mean, squeaky <laughs> sign in the wind going, ee, 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 ee. Look. El Dorado, population dose. It's expensive. I mean, yeah. You just, make a pretty <laughs> penny out of that. But I mean, maybe that's, just, you know. The world's biggest tourist <laughs> letdown. You finally find it and it's, it's just like Ikea's table. accented in gold. <laughs> yeah, or, or just like. It's it's like a yellowish paint. It's a goldish yellow. Right. Though. I guess I guess it's gold. You know what yeah. I mean? Or or one of the residents pees bright yellow because they don't like to drink a lot of water. Right. <laughs> or you just wash. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> if it's real, then it must be exaggerated. Okay. Yeah. Or someone just went buck wild with like the mm -hmm. the color gold on their house, and someone was like, "Wow, look at that! Look at El Dorado, the golden house." Yeah. Well, yeah. to flex my historical ignorance, the. The reality <laughs> is that conquistadors came over, saw established civilizations and cities that were pretty, like, they did garner a lot of their own wealth, much like many civilizations across the world have. And immediately because they're seeing dollar signs in their eyes, they're going, wow, you have a lot of gold, you have a lot of jade, you have a lot of these other right. expensive rare items you must be flush with it because they also hear the rumors of mm -hmm. these stories. And so is it, to your point, a conflation between I see gold over there and I'm picking up folklore and I'm mixing the two into a reality or is it exaggerated already? You know, all of those. things. Yeah. So I'm very curious to see like yeah. what information that kind of like lends itself to maybe some truth yeah. behind this or how the story came to be. Mm -hmm. For sure. So these rumors, as we're kind of talking about grew even stronger after conquistadors, as I was saying, found the Inca and Aztec empires. These empires were full of gold and riches, and in the early 1500s, and after the discovery of gold at Lake Guadavita in Colombia, it really seemed to add fuel to this fire mm. of rumors. So there's part of the reality okay. to the story. All right, so it's not just like, hey, I have this story and nothing to back it up. Mm -hmm. Like, they, So they found a ton of gold in a river? Well, yeah, so they, they discovered uh, gold sources mm -hmm. in Colombia. They also saw that civilizations had, had acquired their of, own yeah, gold. Their and own so gold. I think that's my own personal right. conjecture that they combined what could have been folklore, right. uh, stories of Who's, these, these uh, mm -hmm. lost cities, combined with what they're seeing for the very first time, reactionary. Right. Who's to say what 
their stories uh, that they're telling us aren't true. Right. Because right? they're seeing gold here and there. Now, I will pin that to the board because there's going to be some anecdotal experiences coming out as these expeditions head into the wilderness. And we'll start to be able, I think you and I, to delineate maybe some of that fact and fiction. But we'll get there. Pin Sweet. that thought, though. So continuing on with the history, moving on now into the 16th and 17th centuries, you have Europeans that grew to believe that there could in fact, or must be in fact, great wealth and possibly a city made entirely out of gold. Now, one of the earliest accounts of an El Dorado type city came after Pedro da Silva's expedition along the Orinoco River, where rumors of a golden city, possibly called Meta or Manoa, though many sources identify this location specifically as Manoa, came forward. One of these men claimed to have visited Manoa after being taken by an indigenous group in 1570. Manoa was believed to have been another empire, much like Aztec or the Inca, that existed in a yet-to-be-conquered Guiana Highlands in modern-day Venezuela. Some said Manoa was on the edge of Lake Perime. Many expeditions would end up searching for Manoa specifically. So this begins the... Oh, it seems like there's multiple locations right. of interest at this point. Absolutely. So this starts to open up the history of El Dorado to be a catch-all for several potential lost cities of gold. Yeah, that I didn't know. Yeah. Actually, that is my next point here in my outline. <laughs> uh, many of these stories started to spread, and the idea of El Dorado specifically came to describe any place where wealth and riches could be found. Uh, oh. Like I mentioned, one was a lake, but a lot of these are lost cities, potentially. And we're at the end of this actually going to talk about some of the other popular lost cities in the South Americas and explore some of the details around those. That's really cool. I mean, like, I just never thought, I guess it's just easier to explain and kind of tell a story around one mm -hmm. place that's full of riches as opposed to, look, you get some riches here, a little bit more over there, a little right. bit less over there. You don't want to play favorites with your yeah. favorite gold cities no, lost to time. You, no. you just want to catch on. Group them all together. Right. Give them a new name. <laughs> <laughs> a similar legend actually rose around the same time in the 16th century. And this you might have heard of as well, called the Seven Cities of Gold. These were said to be golden cities just like El Dorado, but located in now what is known to be Mexico. But with that said, that's a little crash course on the history of the idea of El Dorado. We're going to move forward into some of the more famous expeditions, how those unfolded, what they saw, how they came to find what they found or didn't. Of course, we can't cover all of them, right. but we're going to go after the big ones. Ooh. all the way up to some of the more modern looks in the areas. Not a lot of extensive expedition work, okay. but using modern technology, there have been recent revelations in Ooh. the 21st century. All right, there we go. I love that. Yeah. There's the meat and the potatoes. So, of course, multiple explorers sent expeditions all over South America to search for the mythical El Dorado. We're going to start with the expedition of Gonzalo Pizarro in February of 1541. He was a conquistador, and he began his search for El Dorado, and another rumored city called the Land of Cinnamon started in Quito, Ecuador. Now, this is on the northwest edge of the continent, just to give you a general idea of where we're at. The Land of Cinnamon, I'd never heard of this before, but in the research, the Land of Cinnamon is a similar legend to El Dorado, but instead of gold, it is another rich. It's a spice. Of course, cinnamon, a, a land or an area said yeah. to be rich in cinnamon. And boy, do I love me some cinnamon. And cinnamon is delicious, but I've mean, never heard of <laughs> it's, never heard of this location. We are uh, grateful to have inherited a globalized earth. Commodities True. fly all over the place, but in the 1500s, right. you got to imagine many people didn't even know what it would taste like, smell like, or even know what it was. Oh, so you got to think in that mindset, right? Where you're where like, people are just like, oh my God, this is so unique. Yeah. You think about the tea trade, the spice trade. Yep. That was big. A lot of big stuff going on. Um, so yeah. Here, here's a couple of things. I mean, in oh, yeah. doors, they're going around, mm -hmm. new discovered land, meeting new, this new cult, these new cultures, these new people. Right. I mean, if they find these golden cities or El Dorado, they're probably going to try and brute force take it, no? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And factually yeah. so. I'm, just, you know. I, I'm not going to stray away from it. I mean, it's not the subject of this episode. Oh, no, no, not at all. That but brute I'm just forcing like, happened Wait, they find lot. it, and then they leave and come back with more people and then take it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That being said. There's a few stories in here for it, sure. Why? I, I just, 
it was just always the thing. Mm -hmm. Why is gold so valuable? Is it because it's there's a finite amount? Is it because we just say that it is? I mean, obviously, a, a little portion yeah. of it is to say the way it is. Is it like a, a, a great conductor for a, a multitude of things that humans need mm -hmm. and use? Or why is there so much value in gold? So historically speaking, that's a very good question. Nowadays, we know about electricity. We know about its value as a conductor, very yeah. efficient. But when you think back hundreds of years ago, it's a good question. And I think it's because it's pliable. You can make a lot of jewelry out of it. It's very brilliant and mm -hmm. bright yeah. and also very rare. You have to imagine over centuries, if not millennia, peoples would find what was rare and basically filter out the stuff that was common, perhaps like yeah. iron and stone and other things that were less common, right. such as jade, silver, gold, True. things of that nature. I'm assuming just, you know, people popping up in the markets and it's just like, you know, hey, got a rock. $15 and it's like I just the same rock is right, right. there for free right and so it's go, that natural supply right. and demand and then you go hold on I got this uh why, why is this uh why is this ooh, $100 ooh. now that it's, rock is looking shiny. really good it's kind of catching my attention yeah. why is it $100 and it's like well it's it's gold and it's hard to find it's like oh well, I haven't seen that before yeah huh? I love the idea that at the end of the day Humans are just like raccoons. We see something shiny <laughs> and we gotta, we gotta kind of just open. collect it. Yeah, our hands are graspy. You know, we're just gimme. <laughs> gimme. You know, we just want to collect shiny things. But really, it's it's because it was such a beautiful decoration. Yeah. And because it is a soft metal, it can be uh, used to do a lot of things and it becomes very flexible in early civilization uh, as opposed to something harder like a diamond. Right. No, it completely makes but sense. Yeah. That's what That's what I thought. It's a very good question. I was just like, why do we care about right. gold that much? Is it because just what I think it is? Okay, cool. Yeah. Platinum, another shiny metal. Do I know that I'm going off on a rare. tangent here. I mean, did you like meteorites? Are those worth anything? Uh, Dep I don't know what the value would be, but absolutely depending, right? Because right, a lot of meteorites are common materials like iron. Um, nothing too crazy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it is known to be from an asteroid or a meteor or whatever... And it's fashioned into, you know, some sort of jewelry. I think there's some collectible idea around oh, that. That's pretty but, cool. but also at the end of this day, this planet has made from asteroids and meteorites just right. slowly collecting over collecting time. Collecting together, yeah. That's just, that's just me though. Cool. But yeah, gold. People like it. People do. People like them gold. Pe people are after that gold. <laughs> now, when it comes to Gonzalo Pizarro, he described El Dorado as a lake rather than a person or a city. I find that very interesting. He brought with him hundreds of conquistadors and captured 3,000 native peoples as well that he then used as slaves. These native peoples were shackled together along with horses, llamas, hogs, and hunting dogs. Together, they had to cross the Andes Mountains on their expedition. They questioned any native peoples that they came across, and when the people could not provide the information that they were looking for on El Dorado, they were then attacked. The group continued along the river that they were going by. It is believed to be the Coca River. And along that path, they found a local tribe chief. We don't know which tribe Delicola comes from, but we do know the name of the tribal chief was Delicola. Now, this chief told them what they wanted to hear after learning of all the previous attacks. It's almost like, <laughs> like a torture method. You're just going to get some information out yeah. because people are going to protect themselves. Exactly. You don't know how accurate it's going right. to end up being. But to save his people and himself, of course, he gives them whatever information he thinks it is that they want to hear. Now, he told them this, that there were, quote, very great populations further on down the river, as well as, quote, very rich regions full of powerful lords. Now, it is worth knowing the Coca River continues on and becomes, I believe, an estuary of the greater Amazon. Well, this is actually when Pizarro demanded a boat to be built that would carry half of his men down the river while the other half would follow along on the land. And it's actually during this very expedition that the river known as the Amazon River became first discovered by the Europeans. They were the first Europeans to travel down the Amazon and eventually followed it to the Atlantic Ocean. So oh. remember, we're on the west side of the continent. Yeah. They go down a river that crosses Ecuador, that branches into the Amazon, and then they cross essentially 80% of the continent to get out east to the Atlantic. This is a big a, honking river. Yeah, that river is massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a, the Amazon's huge. We, we know. We discussed yeah. that, yeah. But still, it's just like very impressive. I mean, that's a 
good way to get rid of them for a very long time. Right. <laughs> but also you have to start asking yourself, is he telling the truth to save themselves? Is he accentuating the truth or is he just lying to have them go off? Because either way, they do head down the river where there is a much bigger river along which there are other civilizations that could be better sourced, whether it be because of the river's accessibility yeah. or other resources. That's really hard to determine. I feel like he just give him he just gave him like a really big generalization, right? Mm. Like if you're interrogating me right now and you're like, tell me where is the city of gold? And I'm like, well, okay, if you go outside, you're gonna see a street. And that street's gonna break into a faster street. Okay, then you go down the faster street and you're gonna see a lot of exits and civilizations Ignore along the way. Ignore those exits. Get out of town. <laughs> it's just like, all right, I yeah. let you from a street to a highway. Right. That's and true. they told you to avoid the exits and then keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find the highway and never stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, this leads us to actually the etymology, the origin of the name for the Amazon. Oh. It is an unfortunate backstory because while there, somewhere along the Amazon River, they fought against women and men of the Tapuyas, which led the river to be called Amazon after the Greek legend. So it does have some bloodshed behind the name. Mm. Eventually, Pizarro turned his remaining men around and headed back to Quito, and thus ends his expedition. The way I thought it would, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you just keep going down. You're coming in as an outsider, as a stranger. You're coming in aggressive. Very your numbers are just going to keep dwindling, yeah. right? Like you're you're coming across like troops and civilizations that are, I don't know, refreshed, right? You're not fighting the same uh, opposing enemy over and over and mm -hmm. over again, the same people. You're And they're sharing right? word and you've been of what's traveling. going on. They're just resting yep. on their lands. And yep. then you, you come through and uh, obviously you can overpower some, if not a lot of places, but eventually you're just going to keep wearing yourself thin. Right. And this begins a long and storied history of people coming to South America and brute forcing their way into the continent to explore it. And, you know, that doesn't help the situation. It doesn't help that you're trying to find this lost city of gold. It doesn't help that you're trying to loot and take things for granted and mm -hmm. take advantage of things. It doesn't help that you're not even working alongside the local peoples and the indigenous tribes of the area. Yeah. And this only, this is only the beginning of these tales, right? So as we get into these next couple expeditions, you'll see how that just builds up. But you got to remember that these tribes are going to remember. They're right. going to remember you. Yeah. And it, it, yeah, it's not going to, so even if this city does exist, how you think that acting this way is going to help. Right. Right. You're not going to get any real information. They're like, no, get out of here. But the, the first person that, talked about El Dorado or like cities of gold really messed things up for a lot of people. Yeah, there's a <laughs> lot of, man, there's a lot of bad people throughout history. But with that said, let's move on to the next expedition. This is Raleigh's first voyage to Guiana. And you might recognize this name because we've talked about him before, but this might be perhaps one of the most famous of the El Dorado searchers, Sir Walter Raleigh. We mentioned this explorer in our episode of Roanoke, since he sponsored the creation of that colony. It's also why you have Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, <laughs> I was like, it sounds like Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah. So this is a couple decades before the colonization of Eastern, what is now United States. So the colonies haven't started yet. Mm -hmm. I think that's around 1620, or at least that's Plymouth, the United States. I don't know when the colonies themselves, because I'm bad at Or is an explorer. Yeah. I mean, that's what he was, was a British explorer. Yeah. So Raleigh set out to find El Dorado after supposedly capturing Spanish conquistador Don Pedro Sarmiento de Gamboa and learning of the Golden City. So he captured a conquistador and in that capturing, he heard the stories of it. And he also heard the stories of Manoa and Lake Perime. Along with knowledge of the city, Gamboa also told Raleigh about another conquistador named Don Antonio de Berrio the colonial governor of Trinidad who went on expeditions to find El Dorado in both 1584 and 1587. So just a, a brief reference to some smaller expeditions there. And yeah. this is inspiring a greater journey back to South America from the, from the British now. 
So Berrio and Raleigh were in a sort of unspoken feud over obtaining the gold for their respective countries. As you can imagine, what fueled a lot of the turmoil around the New World. European nations fighting to capture and take and have Oh, I bet. Everyone wants to be the person that gets there first. Right. Or make Point. a name for themselves mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So in 1594, you have Raleigh who sent Jacob Whitten on a preliminary mission down to Trinidad, where these other two smaller expeditions kind of hailed from, as well as the Orinoco Delta to survey the area. Where can we start? Let's get a foothold. Let's talk about it. Raleigh decided that he would need eight ships to complete his expedition and raised around 60,000 pounds to make this happen. Not going to worry about an inflation calculator because on this time scale, it's right. wild. But you got to think around 1,600, 60,000 pounds. That's a lot. That's good money I mean, right there. I mean, 60, 60, what, 60,000 pounds? 60,000 pounds. That's, that's meaty today. That's meaty today. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's just investors, right? Like you just pitch it yeah. to people and... That or the government. You're the government. Yeah. And you're like, look... You know, you give me this money, I come back with a boatload of gold. Mm -hmm. We all get a little slice. Yeah. Well, I guess government, you, 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 the king, yeah, the crown. Yeah, probably the, the crown. So now February 6th, 1595, not but maybe a year later, Raleigh's getting impatient. And he leaves Plymouth, England with only four ships and around 250 men. A little short of, I guess that's exactly half of what he was hoping to have had. Seems going like, into it. Seems like he got antsy, right? He's, Very he's, antsy. He's late. It seems like he's, I mean, I wouldn't say late. I don't have enough information, but it certainly doesn't seem like he's early to this race or right, story. Right. And now he's like, come on, come on. Like building ships takes a long, a long time. Recruiting people takes yeah. a long time. It's probably antsy hearing people like making moves over there, exploring. It's mm -hmm. like, get me out there. Well, the sooner he gets out there, the sooner he can hopefully beat other people out. Cause yeah. he's like, listen, they might've been exploring on and off for the past couple decades. But the longer time goes on, the more people find out about it and, mm -hmm. and the more crowded. So, gets, you know, yeah. he's jumping on it. And the reason why I know 1620 for Plymouth, Massachusetts is because I was I was really trying to make sure that he's not coming from a freshly colonized United States. Uh, he's coming from Plymouth, England. England, yeah, yeah. Just to England. totally nail that all down. So he leaves Feb 6, 1595. Four ships, 250 men. Raleigh and his men reached Trinidad, where they attacked the Spanish garrison of San Jose in order to eliminate the risks of leaving their ships behind, which they thought would potentially be attacked. If they left them on the shoreline and then went deeper into the continent, they thought maybe the Spanish would simply destroy their ships, leaving them stranded. So they did a preemptive attack to say, well, we'll just attack you, so you can't attack us. That's wild. You're still going to leave your ships there. I know. Like, I, I don't know. I feel like it takes one person and maybe like, Throw a lamp on it or something or a torch and work on your relationships. That's you know, just... let me just say this. Talk about it. Let's talk about our <laughs> like, feelings, guys. Let's look, like extend an arm. Look, none of this is justifiable, but I do see why they thought that way. Yeah. But, like past the like first initial battle, it's like, well, I mean, then someone comes along and goes, hey, I'm going to go to the 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 neighboring town, mm -hmm. neighboring people. Oh, my God. What happened here? There's four ships and no one left. Right. And what are they going to do? Just let the ships ride like and sit there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it's it's already. Uh, Make peace. And just be like, hey, we're here to explore. Right. You right. know, hello. Hi. And we'll, then just we'll split it. You know, team up. I don't know. I feel <laughs> yeah. like if you find a full city of gold, you need 250 people to split it up. No, no, no. Come on. Just. Yeah. That's just me. A humble human being, <laughs> not a. 1600s true uh, explorer explorer from a specific country but whatever so berrio was also in san jose at that time the very person who ran a couple expeditions a decade ago and Raleigh actually met up with him in Raleigh's book the discovery of guiana he shares that after meeting with berrio Raleigh took 100 of berrio's men up river with enough supplies to last them one month though some sources claim that berrio joined Raleigh. So this is where history gets a little bit uh, inky, a little bloody, a little right, hard to decipher. Track who said what? Right, they could also just years be, ago. They could have also just like taken the whole town out and came back and said, "Oh no, we were diplomatic." Yeah, you know, and then just oh, it, it's hard to percent. tell, you know. But either way, it does seem, at least according to the stories, that some of the men there, local, joined in on this expedition. The conditions were harsh, consisting of, of course, intense heat and rain. They traveled roughly 250 miles or just about 400 kilometers up the Orinoco to where it met the Caroni River. And apologies in advance to all of my 
pronunciations. I'll do my best. But at a native settlement of Morikito, Rally met tribal chief Topiawari. And Topiawari told Rally that the border of El Dorado was but four days away, but he would need way more men and arms in order to get there successfully. Kind of daunting. Scary, even. Oh, it's just a few days that way. But you're going to need a lot more men, what a, a lot what more an weapons. interesting play. Mm -hmm. I know exactly mm -hmm. the location and the amount of time it takes to get there. But bring more men. Right. The, the, that's the, the last part of that is what kind of confuses me. Yeah. The arms like, or the men? The ar I mean, the men. Yeah. Right? Because good chance you're lying. If you lie, they have a lot of people now. Right. I mean, they have a lot. Now they have even more. And they'd be like, you said it was four days. Get more right. men. I got more men. It's not over there. Right. On the flip side, you send them into the most treacherous area of the jungle that, uh, you're, that your people know very well. Right. Where they would die off. Yeah. And you jump them and take their goodies. I don't know. You know? Yeah, true. I mean, then, yeah. That's the, that like is I the flip said, side. There's some really strained relationships in this area. True. And uh, well-deserved because there's a lot of violence happening. <laughs> Either way, though, I mean, the misdirects are, are um, not something I I really thought about. Same. But yeah, it's, same. it's interesting how you see different leaders mm -hmm. of the tribes misdirecting right. with what information. It really is hard to not read this. That's what I assume. Yeah, anyway. it's, it's really hard to not read this with a cynical tone, knowing that there's a lot of unfair attacking and, the, and then people will talk about it, of mm -hmm. course. And so, of course, they then want to protect themselves. So you don't really know what everyone's motive is. I think that that might be even part of the, the mystery and the unknown here. Either way, like I said, Topiawari mentioned that it's four days this way, need more people, more arms. They did not find El Dorado and they returned to Britain in August of 1595, so a handful of months later. But due to the handful of treasures Rally found while on the expedition, he was still convinced El Dorado must exist. Basically, everyone finds enough proof to, to validate the belief. When they go out there, they, they're like, they find enough. So they might find some treasures. So you're like, ooh, that's titillating me enough. Or they mm -hmm. might find some people with stories to continue expanding. So the story continues to appetite people back, whether it's there or not. That's the question. Yeah, I mean, he could be coming across like small villages, towns, uh, wandering merchants or whatnot, right? People looking to trade and just mm -hmm. like, whoa, where are you getting that, I don't know, gold rock from right yeah it's a good size right where do you where'd you get it it's hard to find there must it must be here look at these giant sprinkles of gold here and there yeah it could also be a logical fallacy where you're just seeking to prove your motive right oh true and and i, I think really that could be what's happening either way it Factually is true. The jungle is dense and there are, there are definitely many lost That's cities good but luck. solid gold i don't know i don't know but to close out the idea of this expedition is to open up a new one. But when Raleigh returned to London, interestingly enough, he was convicted of planning to overthrow King James I and was sentenced to prison in 1603. So eight years after getting back, he's tossed in the brig. What? Yeah. What a, what a twist. What a twist. Now, Christian, this is me firing from the hip, so let me know if you have any information on this. But was this some ill-meaning counter expeditioneer trying to be like no get rid of him i want to go search for it or was there any foul play in play or was this maybe in regards to raleigh's imprisonment yeah 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 it's a it's a lot of european history that did not necessarily pertain to el dorado specifically Got so it. we omitted Fair. it but no Fair it enough. was uh charges of treason regarding i think queen elizabeth the first i don't remember the exact uh monarch mm -hmm. um regarding her death and King James the first's ascension. A lot of political theories, Got treason, it. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. A lot, like I said, a lot of European history yeah. that we just that, didn't get into. A lot of, the there's a lot of, story. of <laughs> very relevant tangential stories, but yeah, yeah, you go down huge rabbit holes. Okay. Fair enough. I just wanted to ask. Right. With that, let's discuss the next expedition. Rally's back on the menu. He's got a Wait, second what? expedition. <laughs> Double twist. What? <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, baby. <laughs> What? That's right. Okay, so he's an explorer, and then he comes back, and he's mm -hmm, possibly mm -hmm. had his hand in some political uh, uh, shenanigans. He gets thrown in the brig, and now he's back exploring again. Yeah, after exploring every nook and cranny of oh, his right. prison I mean, cell. Eventually, he does discover North... I mean, I guess, like, Riley, North Carolina. He commissions He commissions it. it. He commissions yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So um, he gets out, and yeah. he's still exploring. Yeah. Okay. So... 
Flashing forward now, James I released him from prison in 1616 and in 1617 officially pardoned him and sent him on a second expedition to Guiana in search of a gold mine. So he spent, man, what is that, 13 long years in prison, and now he's able to stretch his little legs and get back out there. He's, he's damn Sean Connery. He's Mason in the rock. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like he's locked up, but obviously Nicolas Cage needs him yeah. because he knows the rock inside out. Mm -hmm. He's been to the Amazon. Yeah. He's talked to people. He's explored a lot. You don't have to re-explore it because he knows. So you get him out of there. Yeah. You use I, him. I was going to go with a recent example of like <laughs> Giancarlo Esposito yeah. in uh, Kaleidoscope. Oh. Yeah. Watching watch any that. order. It doesn't yeah, matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> all right. All right. Back to, back to the story here. So Rally set out on June 12th, 1617, this time with a nice juicy 14 ships. <laughs> Six more than what he wanted before, 10 more than what he had before. So he's got a good crew now. Jesus, they released them and then just gave him an arsenal. I mean, the king not only did the, hey, treasonous, Pardon. blah, blah, blahs, yeah. you're arrested. Wait a minute, gold mine? I need you. You're back out. Oh, yeah. Make money. Now, along this expedition, illness took the lives of many of the men and even took a toll on Rally himself. And by the time that they arrived at the coast of South America, Rally was too weak in order to lead the expedition. And so Lawrence Camus took charge. From here, once again, they followed the Orinoco River down the coast of South America. Two of the ships fell victims to the rough waters, while the other three reached San Tomé. Now, I imagine that that means nine ships stayed back, five went down the river to continue the expedition, two of which sank, just based on the notes here. Is that correct, Christian? I can double check. Okay. The thing that would bug me the most about this expedition is just like, where do you stop and walk into the land? And you know what I mean? And how, me? Nowhere. And, right, nowhere. That's that's the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, and how deep, you know what I mean? Like you could, you could literally be on the ship setting sail down the river mm -hmm. and it could just be like three miles to the left. Oh yeah. <laughs> it just, really could just be going away from it. No joke. <laughs> yeah. It could be. It's just so difficult. Like how do you actually, I don't know, cover that. Yeah. You really don't. And that's why, and again, this is using hindsight and also yeah. just a regular dude with no skin in the game here. But if I'm literally trying to find something i'm just trying to discover it i'm not out here looking for riches and i'm and i would be working with local peoples to talk with them yeah. about what they know mm -hmm. and actually working alongside them if if that's something that they're interested in I'm not trying to brute force my way through this because this is a treacherous area it is a dense dense jungle even to this day and so it is entirely possible that you're on deck of a ship looking out into the jungle and you can't see past 10 feet yeah yeah so you're right they could have like rubbed noses with El Dorado and not, never yeah. known it. Yeah. That's just flabbergasting <laughs> yeah. and, and very frustrating. frustrating. Oh, yeah. All right. So, three ships now reach San Tome. I'm going to have Christian just check just to be sure. But while he looks that up, I will continue. So, Chemis, who took over the expedition and the remaining men, were attacked by the Spanish garrison, likely retaliation from the previous attacks inflicted by Rally. Okay. They started a little fight. They're going right. to remember. Rally was back at the ships then, right? Because he was sick. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I guess they were just like, hey, so he's, you yes. got a boy named Rally? Yeah. yeah. yeah All right, yeah. let's fight. Is that is that is that your boy? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Damn, he wasn't even there. Yeah. Here's the thing. Rally is on a ship off the coast, kind of anchored up, hanging, yeah. sick, weak. Well, okay. So they were attacked by a Spanish garrison. Later that night, English explorers supposedly stormed the town in retaliation so it's just a, a fight begets a fight begets right, a fight. Just going back and forth. So Rally stays back on the ship. This fight was actually led by Rally's 22-year-old son Walter, aka Watt. Watt unfortunately was killed after getting a musket ball to the throat, as well as four others who also saw their end there in that fight. Rally, who was still okay, I, I misspoke. He was still on the shore near the ships and stuff. He just mm -hmm. didn't go into land. But right. basically, he's he's in bed rest. Yeah. He's still on the shore. He was unaware of the attacks of the deaths for, for roughly a month until he overheard people nearby discussing the deaths. So that's kind of how sprawled out these guys are. He's camped out on the shoreline. He's got people in further. 
And then there's a ship expedition. But I guess Mayfair. he's more. I mean, I didn't think that he was necessarily leading. Mm -hmm. But maybe he's not even like a up the chain. Well, at he all? was. Like, he, I mean, he was is he leading, like a, but he's just too oh, weak for okay. this. Then why wouldn't they bring this news to him? You know, maybe it just. I don't know. Scared. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, like hey, I mean, maybe we lost a lot of people, including we, your son. We, Oops. You know, if it runs a tight ship. Yeah. I don't know, man. Maybe they shouldn't have attacked. Whatever. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. This is what happened. So, Rally soon received a letter from Chemis with the news of his son's death. So, maybe uh, maybe they were going to tell him. And it just took a little bit of time for that snail mail to make it up the river. Rally later wrote to his wife with the news that he, quote, never knew what sorrow meant till now. By this point, Chemis was losing hope and was aware that he had breached James I and Rally's agreement to not get into conflict with the Spanish. It doesn't matter who started it or who retaliated or what have you, because the condition that James I and Raleigh agreed upon before James I would allow the expedition to begin was that they wouldn't get into another conflict with the Spanish. So either way, this is gone real up creek without a paddle. Right, you're gonna, end up, you're gonna end up in jail again. Oh yeah. Also, why you say yes to that? You know what I mean? I don't know. If it was me, Spanish are just throwing rocks at my ship. I'm, I'm beefing. You know what I'm uh, saying? You, you might be beefing. Leave I would have said, alone. Mr. King, James, Yeah, Mr. First. What if we need um, to defend ourselves? Listen, we attacked them pretty bad last time. They're going to come after I'm, us. I'll, that's I'll, that's I'll true. I'll promise you I won't do it again. That was a big mistake. But if I go down there, it is likely that they will uh, They'll the, the, remember. Yeah. and <laughs> They're going to pop off on site. <laughs> we're not just going to, you know, hang, hang 10 with our tootsies out. Right. Saying, oops, you know. <laughs> I don't know. It, it yeah. I guess. But again, I mean, if that was the only way to go, then he's they got take, gold he's madness. Gonna, yeah. He's going to take it. I think. Yeah. I, and I you, think and he really wanted to get back out there, too. Right. It seemed like he was dead set on That's this. What it is. El Dorado exists. I'll do anything to get back out. I'll there. just say whatever I need to say to get over there also, because I want to find Gets you out of jail. Gets you out of jail. And then even if you maybe uh, bend a few rules, if you find it, maybe that will make up for it. So it's really a, a gambler's fallacy here. They're going all in. So Chemis, coming back to him before his kind of doubt fully sinks in, he sent one last group of men in search of the mine upriver from San Tome. But his search was as unsuccessful as the others, and therefore they returned to San Tome for 29 days before leaving town. The English cleared the city of all of its valuables before then burning it to the ground. Mm, of course. Mm -hmm. Just take it all. That's all. I mean, we couldn't find what we wanted, so let's just have this. Yeah, we'll just take whatever the natives have. Right. The remaining men were reunited with Rally on March 2nd, 1618, where Chemus begged Rally for forgiveness. Because obviously, so so let's break it down. I might have been a little confusing, so I want to reiterate. Rally stays back at the shore, holding down the very, very base camp. There's people around there, but ultimately an expedition goes down the river. Led or, by Chemus. Orinoco, yeah, down to San Tome. And from there, they kind of run off a few legs of expedition, and that's the group that gets attacked by the Spanish. Chemus fights back. He recognizes not only is he failing, not only is he increasing doubts in this mission, but he also knows that he himself broke a promise between the king of all people and the actual leader of this expedition, his number one. He's the number two. Yeah. And so in his mind, he is desperately seeking for forgiveness because he feels he's failed in every single way on this mission. At that point, after begging for forgiveness, Chemus returns to his cabin and he ends his own life. Oh. Yeah. After that, everybody left over, went back to England, and now back in England, Raleigh was imprisoned once again, and James I worked to reconcile with the Spanish to repair any damages to the relationships that they had had. So those are the three expeditions from history that we're going to dive deep on, and I know Christian has something he wants to add before we dive into the more recent looks into South America. Oh, yeah, just to answer your question about trying to figure out the, the allotment of the ships mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how many were in one place at any time. Just looking right now, I can't really find anything. It's okay. just said that, you know, he had X number of ships on the expedition, not really finding the sure breakdown. Got it. I will say, just to add kind of additional historical context, when Raleigh went back to England, he was imprisoned because of the violation of the no conflict, essentially, yeah. rule against the, the Spanish. And uh, as a result of that, he was later executed in that year. Oh, yeah. wow. Ooh. I mean, it's a big thing to, on behalf of a full nation yeah. and a new land, really turn relationships over. I mean, it had already been done, right? The deed was done years prior, but either way, 
It's a big made, gamble. Made it worse. Made it got worse. Big gamble. Oh yeah. Well, hello there, Task Force. This is the uh, small break in the episode where I get to talk directly to your eardrums about what's going on in Red Web and just vamp a little bit. Today, we're talking about gold and talking about lost civilizations, but normally I get to, you know, give you a little breather from all the unsettling unknown that might be out there creeping around in your backyards or uh, national parks, whatever, whatever's going on. I don't know. Like, you know, there's aliens everywhere coming to get you. But uh, what's going on in Red Web? Well, we have some Valentine's merch coming way ahead of the game, so that way you can get it in time for the date itself, whether it's for yourself or a loved one. If you want to get your loved ones a Valentine's card, it says you are bootyful. Is that what it says, Christian? Bootyful. Bootyful. Yes, that's because we have on our shirt the baby hands, who's all caked up, dressed up like a uh, like a Cupid. That's there's on the levels. front of the card. Yeah, there's the boo for the ghost, there's the booty for the baby hands booty. For the booty. Levels. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's like a triple entendre. <laughs> And uh, we also have a shirt. It's embroidered. It's a small kind of hit on the left chest area. So go check that out. Store.roosterteeth.com. Get yourself something for Valentine's Day and support this show. Thank you all, Task Force, so much. As always, you guys continue to outpour that love with those five-star reviews. No matter where you listen, whether it be Spotify, Google Play, anywhere. It means a lot. Thank you very much. And with that said, here are a couple of our fantastic sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by HelloFresh. You've got New Year's goals and HelloFresh is here to help you achieve them. Skip the grocery store and take control of your time and budget with delicious recipes delivered right to your door. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant quality meal right in your own kitchen. In fact, HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than takeout. With over 35 weekly recipes, HelloFresh has options you're looking for to help you achieve your goals. Choose calorie smart and carb smart recipes or even customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, upgrading your proteins or adding protein to a veggie dish. I use HelloFresh all the time because if you listen to these ads, you know me, you know I hate the grocery store and I love how tasty every single time HelloFresh is. It's always fresh, it's always all measured out and it gives you instructions in that recipe that are both text and imagery so it's very easy to follow and then you can keep those recipes for life so you always have them in your back pocket. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb21 and use promo code RedWeb21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. You're going to be eating a whole lot on this. Go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb21 and use code RedWeb21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. This episode of RedWeb is also sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. When we're at our best, we can tackle the world, but sometimes life gets bogged down and that can feel overwhelming. But working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you so you're ready to tackle everything that life throws at you. And if you're thinking of trying out therapy, BetterHelp is a fantastic option. First, it's 100% online, so it's convenient. No need to stress yourself about getting to an office or getting there on time if you're driving. Plus, BetterHelp is affordable and flexible. All you've got to do is fill out a quick questionnaire and BetterHelp matches you with a licensed therapist. And if that person is not a fit for you, you can switch a therapist at any time with no additional charge. It's super quick, super easy, and very friendly to use, especially if you're just exploring the world of therapy for the first time. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can help you work on the things that will get you to the best version of you. Visit betterhelp.com slash Red Web today to get 10% off your first month. Once again, that's 10% off your very first month at BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Red Web. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by Shady Rays. Whether you're in the sun or on the slopes, our friends at Shady Rays have you covered. They've got premium polarized shades, customizable snow goggles, and even more. And You can feel good about shopping with them because Shady Rays is an independent company that offers durable, world-class product that's just as good as any expensive pair out there. And they also provide 10 meals to fight hunger in America with every order. Plus, they have an amazing protection plan. They back every pair of sunglasses with lost and broken replacements. So if you lose or break yours, even if it's on the very first day that you bought them and received them, you put them on your face and off they slipped, they'll get you a new pair. No questions asked. It's that simple. I really enjoy Shady Rays because they have a lot of different styles that complement what I'm wearing. No matter what my outfit is, I know I've got a pair of glasses to go with them. 
And I've always talked about this, but I love polarized lenses. They get rid of all those glares that come off the water if you're walking or running nearby a lake, or if you're driving, it gets rid of all the glare off of window screens and everything. It's fantastic, they're affordable, and they look amazing. Exclusively for you, Task Force members, right now, Shady Rays is giving out their best deal of this new year. Go to ShadyRays.com and use promo code REDWEB to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 200,000 people. ShadyRays.com, use promo code REDWEB. And with that said, let's get right back into the mystery. All right, talking about recent history, this is where I love to take those historical ones and bring them, just draw them into the light. So despite the many failed attempts over the many centuries at this point to find El Dorado, conquistadors and explorers continue to search for it up until the 21st century, up until now, we are continuously looking into the Amazon for the unknown and the undiscovered. Many more recent searches have actually focused on the legendary Lake Perime, said to be the location of Manoa, one of the other destinations we talked about at the top. In fact, in 1977, geologists found evidence of an ancient lake in northern Brazil. They found hillsides with an identical horizontal line at about 390 feet above sea level, 420 meters, and having that very flat, very even circumference around this geographical feature seemed to indicate that there was a resting body of water there at some point in time. It has since, of course, maybe gone or maybe dissolved down into a river. But man, that's what I love geology. Uh, like, yeah. If I could go back, maybe I'd try to be a little Indiana Jones boy. <laughs> explore like, and... I just love the idea of using modern technology to explore... I don't know. Like, we feel like this world has been fully covered. We talk about the ocean and space mm -hmm. a lot, but like, there's so much left unknown. I find it so fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I mean, here's the thing. I love the fact that even with modern day technology, you're still not able to find this place. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Granted, most likely made up. Right. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, sure. I'm the skeptic. Spill those beans. Um, but, you know, Fly those planes, or if you if you can or cannot, throw them drones up into the air and get a bigger, right. a, a cast a wider view. Nah, nothing. Mm -hmm. Now jumping forward three decades, in 2007, we have archaeologist Jose Miguel Perez Gomez, who began expeditions to find Lake Perime. And by using indigenous stories, digital elevation models, satellite images, I mean, they're running the gambit. Damn. Yeah, dude. I love to see that. Same. His team was able to digitally reconstruct the lake of southeastern Venezuela. It ended up looking very similar to the maps drawn by Sir Walter Raleigh. That's the kind of juice I like. Oh, yeah. so some of the rivers that Raleigh like sailed down don't mm -hmm. exist anymore. Maybe not the rivers, but on some of his hand-drawn maps, there was a body of water that they mm. presume could be Lake Perime. And, oh, yeah, the lake itself. Yeah, and by using modern technology as well as stories and looking at the land, they reconstructed right what ended up looking just like that hand-drawn map centuries ago. I love that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, this one I wanted to kind of spitball, so I threw this into the notes a little bit. This touches on a lost city that has actually made it into the films in recent years. I don't, I don't think I've actually seen it. The Lost City of Z. Like I said, we're going to talk about a couple of other lost cities in general, but not this one in particular. The reason why, though, I bring this one up is because as recently as May of 2020, per the Smithsonian, modern mapping technology such as the LIDAR has been able to be used to identify large city-like footprints in the Amazon. LIDAR is light detection and ranging. It's, it's essentially a very sophisticated version of sonar. You can create 3D models just by scanning outward. Jesus. Yeah. And so that enables computer software and people using them to cut through the trees to see the geography underneath because all this what? dense jungle it's yeah uh, i mean yeah the jungle is dense i stuff. love it all this dense jungle is covering up how the ground moves and when you're able to penetrate that with lidar you end up with a 3d model that shows structures streets those uh kind of mayan incan-esque pyramidal shapes that yeah. look like pyramids but stair stepped up mm -hmm. you see a little bit of that like rudimentary versions of that obviously worn due to time. And so you can find what amounts to be lost cities throughout the Amazon with this modern technology. Now the question is, is this lost city X, Y, or Z? Is it El Dorado? Yeah. It's really hard to say, but either way, it goes to show that there have been lost cities, regardless of 
gold or not. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's amazing. Yeah. In fact, I just want to say the Lost City of Z was something that as recently as the 20th century, explorations were led by people like Percy Fawcett uh, to, to find this city. I believe, again, I'm, I'm flexing my ignorance here, Percy Fawcett disappeared into the jungle in his expedition to find the Lost City of Z and was never uh, found again. But either way, oh. modern technology, man, is, is really... Uh, accelerating the search in this in this area yeah i mean there's so much technology that we use in our day-to-day -day, know of and then you know discover um on a weekly basis but there's just things like there's so much tech in different professions that you just don't know exists yeah and i consider myself a tech junkie like i love knowing about tech researching tech using tech and you know i'm sure there's some really cool advanced technology around drilling in the ocean you know oh I mean? yeah i mean look we're, we're talking about space at one point like you know the space outfits and suits and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff like that's difficult to put together and engineer yeah man there's just so many cool things and don't even i mean we talk about it all the time don't even get me sorry about the military and all the oh yeah the, i bet they got bunkers and bunkers full of cool tech they like, got bunkers just, under the bunker but, yeah yeah man ah jeez i th see that's that's why I do this podcast is because all that stuff is so fascinating. The, the what ifs, the what could be. I know. I am, I'm so hungry to have those answers, but you can't just have answers straight up. And so in lieu of that, in, in patient waiting for things to be declassified or discovered, we got to fill those gaps with theories yeah, and yeah, we do. whatever knowledge we do have. All right. So at this point, we've explored the history of El Dorado, perhaps how it came to be. We talked about... The original expeditions, some of the biggest ones. We've talked about recent technology and recent explorations into this area. Now I think the last stone to really unturn is some of the factual cultural history that may have inspired the idea of El Dorado. Real or not, there's a lot of really fascinating stuff to dive into that could have been the origin or helped elevate the idea of El Dorado. Ooh. Let's talk about the Muisca Ceremony. Based on the writings by Juan Rodriguez Freal in 1638, El Dorado most likely comes from a ceremony of the Muisca people. Freal states that when a new chief of the Muisca tribe, the Zipa, was to be crowned, he would cover his body in turpentine and gold dust. Spanish explorers, and so pausing, this is perhaps where you get the idea of gold men, not just statues, but it's been seen in the, in the research that there were men of gold in El Dorado. Hmm. Cause like, I think the thing that sparked my interest right there was that you were saying like, could have been inspired by a ceremony. And that's mm -hmm. so in like a different direction than I thought it would be. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Not that there was a statue mm -hmm. of someone made out of gold or anything like that, a ceremony. And I thought to myself, how? Um, but yeah, I mean, if they're just like gold flakes yeah. on a person, and then that just, uh, let me tell you, if that's it, it, this story really ramped up. Let me, yeah, <laughs> let me dig in even further. Like, I want to okay. hear your reaction to this part. So, continuing on that line of thinking, Spanish explorers actually referred to the king as El Hombre Dorado, or the Golden Man, which may have eventually been shortened to El Dorado. So, not only <laughs> could it, like, not be inspired by, by a place, but just so... A man covered in gold flakes. Like, even the name itself isn't necessarily a place, but the man itself. Mm -hmm. Huh. That, that like, I mean, awesome. Yeah. Someone must have been a fantastic storyteller. But boy, oh boy, did this lead a lot of people on a wild goose chase. Right. It, <laughs> I mean, I'm not trying to be too silly about it, but it reminds me straight up of like Asgard is a people, not a place. It is entirely possible, right. thinking about some of these cultural ceremonies, that El Dorado isn't necessarily a place, but rather the idea of a people or a ceremony or if, if just that's, a concept. Yeah, if that's how it really came to be, that would have been so deflating to everyone that spent so to, much time oh, and money. Oh, and I don't care about any of that. I find that gorgeous that's so poetic <laughs> i love that I ignoring any of the explorations and yeah. the violence and the money i just find that to be like that just makes a whole lot more sense it does but i also find that to be much more beautiful as yeah. an answer but continuing on the muisca worshipped 
Chiminigagua, who created the world and light as concepts and also created the sun and the moon, who are in and of themselves their own gods. The shimmering color of gold was associated with the light of the sun, and so they put that gold dust on the Zipa, the new chief once again of the tribe. I mean, look, it makes complete sense, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, using something that's so rare and precious like that to, you know, kind of like pray to a god or worship a god. Like, that's not far-fetched at all whatsoever. Like, that kind of stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Damn. <laughs> like, that's just, look, this is like a theory. Yeah. I just didn't think it ever crossed my mind that it would be a, a, a new chief being brought in covered in flakes of gold. Right. I, man, that's, I, I love this concept. Because, but it, but it does, like, it does kind of have some, you know, like with many theories, it does have some, like, attachments to the story, right? Mm -hmm. The man in gold. Now, check this one. So the Zipa, as part of this ceremony, would be brought to a crater lake. A lake that would be filling a crater. This mm -hmm. was specifically Lake Guatavita. They would be taken there on a raft with attendants and offerings to the god. This lake is near modern-day Bogota. The other people on the raft through offerings called Tunjos, made out of gold into the water. So now you continue to expand the idea. Remember, Conquistador Pizarro, who fervently believed that El Dorado was a lake, that that was the destination. And That's now right. we have a very oh, heavy... Oh, man. Yeah. And I mean, they're also throwing gold into the lake. And so it is possible that a European coming through would see a lake full of gold and go, this is El Dorado. When in fact, it's just part of a ceremony. A ceremony. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, that ties together quite nicely. It really does. Yeah. Okay. So the Zipa would stand in the light of the sun. Once again, covering their, their body would be covered in turpentine and gold dust. And so they would probably be shining like a beacon out there. The Zipa would then jump into the water and wash away the gold dust. I have a picture actually for you now, which is a famous... It, it depicts the ceremony of the Muisco raft. So the little... Uh, my ink was running out, but you can kind of get an idea. It's a gold statue giving you a depiction of what's going on on that raft. You have the servants throwing offerings. You have right. the Zipa in the middle. A lot of... Uh, seems like everything's covered in gold. Yes. Like literally everything. Well, it looks like a gold statue or something. Yeah. Just an art piece. But oh, Task okay. Force, hit us up on social if you want to check it out. Our YouTube channel or on Twitter or Instagram at Red Web Pod. Yeah. yeah. And just covered in gold. That must have been just a beautiful sight to oh, see somebody out there glistening in gold oh, get yeah. into the water and you just <laughs> see the gold like... Yeah. Like uh, a cloud coming off of them. That's what a way to introduce uh, wow. like, the new chief. That's cool. So I'm gonna introduce myself to the paranormal on our next ghost hunt. <laughs> really makes it's that covered in gold. I'll be honest, just makes handshakes look like crap. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, and let me. You know, I'll be honest. You, it's just not gonna. You're gonna see nothing. It's so yeah. dark on our hunts. Yeah, <laughs> you're you're over there. I'm just going. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't see anything. <laughs> I don't see anything. And you're going. I'm bathing in the bodies of Lake Minnetonka. <laughs> gold dust emanating from my skin. And you're like, I, 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 sure, I'll sure. trust you. I'll trust okay. you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let us know if you hear anything. <laughs> Okay, so in 1536, Spanish conquistador Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada and his brother Hernán Pérez de Quesada were headed to Peru with a crew of 800 men. This was until they began hearing stories of the lost city of gold and rerouted toward Muisca. They overtook the Muisca settlements and later in 1545, the Spanish attempted to drain the water of Lake Guatavita in order to find El Dorado. I use air quotes, but probably find the offerings that have been over the years right. passed into the lake. They did find many pieces of gold, though this was likely the offerings to the gods that were thrown into the lake during the ceremony. The Spaniards believed that there must be another location with even more gold. So basically all that is to say, conquistadors and explorers, yeah. whatever, got very close to the truth and then got so greedy because they took this as a sign of a greater wealth right. out there. But in fact, they're just diving into what it actually might have been the origin yeah. of the story i mean it seems like that's exactly what they found mm -hmm. the, the origin right like here you go there's the ceremony i mean there's there's the evidence when you drain the lake yep done also how would you drain a whole lake in 1536 uh, you blow up of, some mountainsides lots of and buckets. a lot of buckets <laughs> a lot of buckets yeah 
Oh, uh, no, it's raining. We got to start over <laughs> Oh, <again>. no. <laughs> Someone throw up a tarp. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. So that is one culturally based, historically based origin for the story of El Dorado. There are a couple others that we're going to discuss, including oh. the Tyrona Lost Cities. That one was pretty strong. Very strong. I think because there are multiple lost cities that have all become known as El Dorado, that maybe that answers for one part of the legend. This answers for another part of the legend. I mean, we did talk about El Dorado could be just all encompassing. That's very true. Yeah, absolutely. So another source of the legend of El Dorado might have been the Tyrona civilization. In the 1970s, Ciudad Perdida, or the Lost City, was found by non-indigenous communities in Colombia's mountains, La Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. The Tyrona lived in the wooded mountains of the Lost City and is said to be 650 years older than Machu Picchu. Ooh. That's on my bucket list, man. Gorgeous Machu Picchu. place. Yeah. After the arrival of Europeans, many Tyrona cities were destroyed. The Tyrona were skilled at goldsmithing and creating gold clothes. I didn't even oh. know you could make clothes out of gold, but oh. they would thread it into their clothes. I'm sure make... you, they could. That just sounds expensive and fancy as hell. I know. That's <laughs> heavy. So they would make clothes, jewelry, pottery, instruments, among many other things. It seemed like gold was abundant for them, but also something that they were skilled in crafting with. So again, we talked about that loosely at the beginning, maybe that this seeming abundance of gold made it seem accessible that a right. whole city could exist. I mean, look, if you have people that specialize in it, you don't specialize in something unless there's repetition. Mm -hmm. So I just don't think I'd scale like if they got clothes made out of it, they must have a city made out of it. I mean, look, if I walked in to like a small town and you had like people just walking around tank tops with, made out of gold, all right? <laughs> okay, uh, all right. All right, like- I, I start I'm, thinking there's a vault nearby. I'm thinking there's, there's a, <laughs> right? There's some okay. kind of like yeah, okay. Scrooge McDuck <laughs> vault of gold nearby yeah. that they're just pulling this all from. And it's it's in such an abundance that they're just wearing it now. I, you know what? That's fair. <laughs> you, know? I, you know what? I guess you're uh, right. Like if, if I came across that, I'd be like, Done. El Dorado is real. Like, <laughs> yeah. Where's your sold. buildings of it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Now, the remote locations of their cities, along with their abundance of gold, in addition to the stories of El Dorado in the region, may have influenced rumors of there being a hidden city of gold. Upon their arrival at Ciudad Perdida, explorers found what they believed to be a map stone. I have a photo of this for you as well. But this map stone, many archaeologists believe that it could be showing directions to other locations. I'll let you go ahead and uh, react and describe to what you're seeing. Um, looks like a fairly big stone. Yeah, do we have a scale on this, Christian? It looks like several feet tall, if not like yeah, five does. plus feet. Yeah, it looks like it has, yeah, a ton of like, honestly, kind of like very deliberate scratches. Like uh, grooves kind yeah, of cut into lines. And, and then it's like lanes that branch out. Mm -hmm. A lot of foliage, a lot of moss on it. But yeah, I mean, you just... It feels like they just carved it right up on a public, like it's like like it's a public map. Yeah, for the town. I mean, it is entirely possible. Again, this is activating some of the lidar Smithsonian article yeah. talking about potential lost cities out there in the Amazon. It's entirely possible that many of these cities actually were connected by road structures, and and to continue the theory anyway, uh, this or or a stone like this could be at a heavy intersection. To tell you how to get to multiple cities for commerce purposes I mean, or just civilization and true, communication purposes. Right? Like, why wouldn't they try to monetize it in some way, shape, or form? In that case, like, you're going to set up shop at the, uh, you know, set up camp over at the location, maybe some chains along the way, set yeah. up some sort of infrastructure. Obviously, you got a lot of gold, it's valuable. You want to get it to other villages, other people. Um, you set those like networks up. Oh yeah, you get a whole business running. Yeah. Now what's interesting to me, and I know Christian's still looking up the size of this stone, but when I look at this stone, there are a lot of lines carved into it. And oh, yeah. far be it for me to expect your normal grid layout from a modern city, which are, depending on how you look at it, efficient, but also inefficient. Um, there are a lot of sprawling lines on this stone. And it would seem, again, in my humble opinion, to be a bit of a, a bit of a chaotic map if it were a map. But I can also picture this stone as being painted to indicate some of these being roads, 
some of these being rivers or bodies of water, or some of these lines just demarking territory in some way. That, mm. I mean, it's possible that these lines mean more than just one thing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of deviating paths, but I mean, if we took one line from the bottom all the way to the top, and assuming this mm -hmm. is somewhere between like three to five feet, each line deviates like 12 times. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. that splits off in itself like four times. Right. And some connects, some don't. And so it's just, it's a, that's, you know, that I reminds, think that's the best way I could describe it. Just it reminds a ton me of, of rivers. branching lines and rivers. Exactly. Yeah, tributaries. But I mean, and if you're tracking and trying to navigate the Amazon, you're mapping it out, like it's going to look like that. It's big, large, confusing. You'll have some roadblocks, you'll have some rivers, you'll have streams and maybe some roads uh, paved out. Yeah. Absolutely. So I can't find anything that's giving an actual measurement of the stone, but I'm seeing other pictures of it and it's human sized. There oh, okay. are full grown adults standing and are about as tall as the stone. Okay. So oh, wow. I would estimate this thing to be two and a half to three feet wide, six feet tall ish. Forgive my metric conversion, roughly a meter wide, maybe just shy of two meters tall, something like that. But now jumping into the modern times in 2019, there was actually another Tyrona sediment was rediscovered by a team led by archaeologist Santiago Giraldo and explorer Albert Lin using, again, LiDAR technology. So to reiterate, light detection ranging. LiDAR technology uses a transmitter that sends out a laser light that reflects off surrounding objects. Again, very much like sonar, but with visual light or light itself. A receiver detects these reflections and, and the time it takes for the light to travel back is used to create or calculate varying distances and you can make a 3D model off of that. Either way, using this technology, there may be six more settlements in this same area. And kind of going off our own theory here, if this stone was some form of map right. to show how these settlements were connected, Boom. makes sense. suddenly you have an, a, a very sprawling civilization in this area where we maybe would have thought not possible, but that's actually just due to a lack of understanding of how people would properly traverse mm -hmm. this area. I mean, look, 2019, when you start, first started talking about like modern day, like exploration into the Amazon looking for El Dorado, I said to myself, why? Like, why? But now, now that we've gone through uh, this, it seems like there are there are reasons, right? You're, you're finding these lost civilizations. I think even if you're not finding El Dorado, it's like yes. you are finding lost civilization. I think that's like, it. And so cool if you do find it. If you don't, you're still finding other things. Right. I think you, whether you're trying to find El Dorado or not, what you're trying to do is discover what might have been lost. And if you yeah. happen to find El Dorado along the way. Bonus. Sure. Big bonus. But it's the discovery of these potential six other settlements using LIDAR that has led a lot of people to believe that maybe this gold was decentralized. Maybe some of these other hubs, these other settlements have more gold than the other ones. So it keeps the, it keeps the idea alive. Yeah. Ever hungrier, we must find more gold. It's funny because you can see this as kind of like, look, you know, it was a part of a ceremony and there's all these connected civilizations and um, towns and people. And there was just stories spread about the ceremony and whatnot. Other people are sitting here saying, like, look, there's more to be discovered. Mm -hmm. Like, we haven't seen it all. Oh, yeah. Man, I love that. I love that. So as a kid, I, I'm just going to go off on a tangent here. I loved ancient Egypt, especially since how common it was in pop culture in the late yeah, 90s, early Egyptian 2000s. Egyptian gods were fun to watch. Man, I, I love all of that. And it really inspired my, my love of the unknown and trying to understand history. Mm -hmm. I almost wish that I had more pop culture pointing me back towards the Amazon and a lot of the cultures there because this is equally fascinating yeah. and for a totally different reason it's yet to be discovered right? right you have the sands of Egypt and a lot of stonework and how is that done and how is it hidden where is it hidden and then you have the dense nature of the forest mm -hmm. that rains a lot and so like there's a lot of changing of the lands yeah isn't the Amazon too doesn't it have isn't that where all the like large underground water tunnels are Oh, I would not be surprised. There's underwater aquifers and stuff where I, you could I, just disappear to. Yeah, I believe there's like you you can explore, but it's like you really can't unless you have like, I, think, I don't know. I forgot, but I believe there's a bunch of underwater connected tunnels, but it might be also where the fresh water meets salt water. And then from there, they literally like sit on top of each other 
and it's very dangerous for divers. And I think they're trying oh. to still to this day map it out. Is that the Amazon? That's a good question. I know that that exists in a few spots. Mm -hmm. Just from a, a very quick cursory Google, it does look like there are reports of some kind of underwater river or underground river beneath the Amazon. Whoa. Yeah. That's yeah. That's I mean, awesome. Talk about like hundreds of miles of it and they'll have divers go down. But it's dangerous because salt water meets fresh water mm -hmm. and you can literally see like a clear divide and that's where you can get lost in it. But then also they're trying to map it out. And I'm just like, oh, that's terrifying. That's, I don't know what, that gives me some sort of primal <laughs> unnerving. Like there's something alien about that. Just like yeah. large, vast caverns that dwarf the size of you. And right. so just, you make, make you feel like nothing. Like yeah. an ant. You know? It's just weird. I mean, could not be the Amazon. I know the Amazon does have underground water tunnels. That's why I brought it up. But mm -hmm. that, I mean, that that stuff that I'm bringing up does exist. Mm -hmm. All right. As we close out, I want to talk about one more uh, city, in fact, that might have influenced the myth of El Dorado. Paititi, in fact, was another legendary, quote, lost city of gold. So Paititi is an Incan city said to be hidden, untouched by conquistadors somewhere east of the Andes. Most sources point to Peru. Once again, you have that on the west coast of South America. Based on writings from a missionary named Andres Lopez from around 1600, Paititi is hidden in the jungle full of riches like gold and silver. It is said to be connected to the legendary Incari. When the last Incan ruler, Atahualpa, was killed by Francisco Pizarro, the brother actually to the Pizarro we talked about, oh. Gonzalo, it was said that he vowed to avenge his death after being reincarnated as the Incari. Supposedly, the Incari founded Paititi, and it is said to hold the remainder of the Inca's gold. Many expeditions have been undertaken in the last century to rediscover Paititi, but have all come up empty-handed. I mean, if it exists, right? Probably, I, I don't know. It's like, seems... it, like, it depends, like, what they use to build, like, what their foundations were made out of. You yeah. Know what I mean, if it was stuff that I could actually wear over time or if it's stuff that would still stand the test of time. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm rereading this. So Andres Lopez wrote about this hit, hidden city of riches in 1600. And so from that alone, it could simply be yet another word of mouth, another myth, as it were. And also being in the 1600s or on 1600 it's hard to say just in my inclination this is my gut instinct going off here uh did it fully inform el dorado maybe maybe not it could have added momentum to yeah, it certainly to say, add fuel to the fire yeah because a couple of expeditions had already happened by this point right, because i was like you said between 1500s and 1600s i think yeah. that's where we started off but this seems a little bit later mm -hmm. and so i mean it's just probably more people have been like look i discovered this it does exist I've, you know another nugget yeah. The gold mine that we're looking for. And then the connection to the expeditions we talked about. It almost seems too poetic to be true, but I also love the idea that there are hidden cities of riches that indigenous peoples know about or maybe don't know about, right. but at least exist. Yeah. And because of the nature with which these expeditions were done, the brute force, brutal nature of them, that it's almost like the land itself retaliated against it. Right. Or the gods themselves retaliated mm -hmm. against to prevent the finding of it from these people in particular, all the way down to the idea that Atahualpa is vowing to avenge his death to these conquistadors, these brothers, when he is reincarnated. If nothing else, it's an amazing story. It's a very fun story. But yeah, that that's kind of the... the that's El Dorado, baby. It's just... Uh... I'm gonna go with the ceremony. The ceremony is is very it nice. It ties closes nicely for oh, me. Oh yeah, it it closes a lot of those like open ends a little bit and grounds it yeah. in a factual reality based on cultural ceremony. I mean, as always, I go into like these episodes not knowing anything, um, or I've heard of it, or maybe mm -hmm. know a little bit about it. Sure. Like El Dorado, and what I'm getting at here is just I just didn't, as usual, expect to have so much in so many different directions right mm -hmm. oh it was a ceremony maybe it was a grouping of places wait what grouping of places disney told me it was one place full of gold right you know and a guy with a little loop would sing a song <laughs> yeah. about it, you know? and 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 then the stories of the explorers and then how they interacted and so 
I don't know. Just like something that I have heard of is now fleshed out to me. So. Yeah. Well, that's the thing we're going to do on Red Web. If you see a title that you recognize, even just like last week, MK Ultra, these are things that I would consider to be household that names. That was good. Thank you. Uh, all credit to the research on that one. I I found that fascinating. But that's the thing is like when you see a title come across your feed as a task force member, Red Web listener, you know that there's more to the story. You're like, oh, I've heard of this. I, mean, I think I know it, but I'll, you know, I'll pop it on. Oh my God, we're going to, we're going to uncover that stuff. We're not out here to retread old ground. We want to dig up the stuff that you haven't heard about, about the familiar, and also introduce you to new topics, new mysteries that you might not have ever heard about. Oh yeah. And with that said, Fredo, I got another one for you right here next week on Monday, and I'll see you there. <laughs>